Take your Bible, please, if you would, and turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. And welcome back home, Edna Unger. God bless you from your trip. Good to have you back. I know your husband's happy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we're in second, uh, 1 John chapter 2, and we're continuing with the, the series of messages as we preach and teach through this epistle. So we've already talked about uh, the joy of believing. We've talked about the glorious light. And chapter 1, verse 7 is a crucial verse of Scripture. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, etc., it's crucial for us to be in the light. Otherwise, we'll never really understand what John is talking about. We talked about, uh, about confession. We talked about commandments. And today we're talking about another subject that I never thought I had a problem with until I started studying this. And then I realized that this, this is for me as much as it's for everybody. It's for all of us. It's about loving your brother in the context of the body of Christ. Now, the thing is, for me, being in the ministry for the last 35, 40 years, we've seen a whole lot of stuff in the church. You know, I used to think that the church was... Um, was like a really holy, sanctified place where only good people went. And then I realized uh, shortly afterwards, that's way far from the truth. The church is, uh, in, in many ways, a hospital. It's a, it's a place where people go to get better. It's a, and in that process, you see a whole lot of stuff happen. And so this, this uh, message today, I've entitled it, Love Made New. We're looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses... 7 through 11. So let me, uh, let me read that, and uh, then we'll get into it. So 1 John 2, verse 7. Brethren, <clears throat> I write no new commandment <clears throat> to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. So right here I would say, wait a minute, it's new, old, what is it? What is it? Which thing is true in him, it's true in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Dear Father, Lord, at first reading of this passage, we may question, Lord, why are you telling us? We know this, but we know in your divine providence you have an eternal word right here for the body of Christ because there are issues within the body of Christ. Lord, we're not talking about loving those outside of the body. We're talking about loving those in the body. So, Lord, help me to preach this message. Lord, help my voice to be clear and strong. Let my mind be sharp. Let my spirit be pure. And, and Lord, in the process of preaching your word, Lord, speak to us. Holy Spirit, come speak to your people today. Speak to those at home. Speak to those here and anoint this message, Lord. Be glorified as we proclaim your truth. Let your church be edified in the process. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here, John is continuing to describe life in the light. That's a very important theme throughout this entire epistle. What is life in the light like? And... Um, as we looked at last time, two weeks ago, and uh, thank you, Bethany, for that great testimony last Sunday, beautiful testimony. But two weeks ago, we were in verses uh, 3 through 6 of chapter 2. And what he was saying there, just in a nutshell, was you can't say that you know God and don't follow the moral code. There's a moral code that you have to live by. And, uh, and, and again, all this, what he's saying is in contrast to the false teachers, the false prophets, the Gnostics of that time that said that Christian ethics is not important. It's not necessary. 
All that's important is your knowledge of God and your spiritual experiences. It's not how you live and how you treat other people. It's just what you know. And John begins in verse number 7 to really refute that logic and reiterate an old commandment, but it's really a new commandment. But it's not a new commandment, it's an old commandment. And he's trying to set the record straight that when you come to Christ, you have to live a certain way. And it has to begin really within the body of Christ, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. So he says to love your brethren, you can't just talk about it. You can't be thinking about it. You have to do it. Every Christian has got to do this. Now, in the culture at the time, it was pretty obvious what he was saying, because at that time, there were Jewish people getting saved. There were Greek people getting saved, Gentile people, heathen, pagan people getting saved, rich people getting saved, poor people. The socially acceptable were getting saved. The social outcasts were getting saved. The prisoners were getting saved. The slaves were getting saved. All these people, the book of Acts says multitudes were coming into the church at that time. So when John's addressing this, he has reason to say, you know, within this new church culture that's emerging, there's gathering and assembling and uh, fellowshipping together, learning together, different races of people, different cultures, different language groups even. You've got to love and respect and honor one another because how you act within the church is really very important. He says in chapter 4, verse 21, if you want to look over there, but I'll read it to you. This commandment we have from, from, from him, that he who loves God must love his brethren. It's not, it's not, you know, it's a mandatory statement. There's no wiggling out of it. You have to love others. And the Gnostics would say, we don't care about each other like that. All we care about is having these spiritual encounters with God. And John is saying, no, how you live amongst yourself is really important. I remember this story. I read it some years ago. It's worth repeating. It's a missionary story about a missionary group that went to Israel to proclaim Christ. And as they were there, they were close to Palestine. And at the time, they were able to go into Israel and Palestine to preach the gospel. It's a marvelous opportunity. But while they were there, they learned firsthand that the Jews and the Palestinians really didn't like each other. They did not like each other. They didn't respect each other. They had a genuine mistrust and a hatred deep down in their heart towards each other. It was traditional, it was cultural, it was embedded in their culture. You say, oh, that's a Jewish person. Right away, the Palestine would hate them and vice versa. It's just the way that it, they were. And this was decades long, uh, abuses, broken promises, etc. But as Christ was preached to both groups, little by little, some would turn to the Lord for salvation. And because of the location of where they were at that time, they had to fellowship in the same place. So you had Jewish people getting saved and Palestinians getting saved. And guess what? They were now fellowshipping with one another. Culturally, they couldn't stand each other. But through grace and through love and through respect and through honoring God's word, those groups, that group of people began to love and honor each other, praying together, worshiping together. You know, singing praises to the Lord together. And you have to know, that pleased the Lord so much. I was thinking, what if now, I mean, we've been praying for the Taliban to get saved over there. Wouldn't it be an awesome thing if some of those Taliban soldiers got saved and sought out a Christian fellowship among the Afghani people who they used to persecute? But how would you feel if, if you were an Afghan Christian and you're welcoming a former Taliban person that's now a Christian? You would have a genuine distrust like Paul did you know, earlier on in his walk. They didn't believe him either. He had to prove himself. But in that case, you have a book of Acts story getting ready to happen, I think. We're praying for that to happen. On a more personal level, and, and keep in mind that John is speaking to Christian people, he's saying you, you have to be loving to one. You, you can't afford to hate your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and like at first glance, you think, well, Lord, yeah, we can't hate each other, but let me run some things by you. What if someone in the church 
hurts you or hurts your spouse or your family, and you confront them and you try to work it out, and there's absolutely no sign of remorse or sorrow. There's only a, a doubling down. You know that phrase, doubling down? I heard it some years ago in the political field. And I, I didn't like it in the very beginning, and I really don't like it now. What I see that infiltrating into the church, people double down in their opinions about things. Not so often do you hear someone willing to admit they were wrong, or they're sorry, or they're, they, they're sorry if they offended anyone. They double down and they get stronger about it. And I, what I'm saying here is, I, I, I long for the time of a genuine repentance to come out within the body of Christ, for a misspoken word, a, mis, a misspoken, a, a unwarranted offense, a, a misdeed that was said, instead of, oh well, they'll get over it. Oh, well, I'm okay now. They'll have to just work it out. Wait, wait a minute. Can, can we just say something here? See, because in that setting, in that setting, unfortunately, the seeds of bitterness are planted. And if it's not addressed, seeds of hatred or blossoms of hatred will come out of that situation. So in verses 7 through 11, John really, I think, addresses this issue and 7 and 8, let's just kind of dissect this a little bit. Verses 7 and 8, I think, might be a play on words. When you look at chapter 2 and verse 3, which we looked at two weeks ago, he's, he's addressing the, the idea of the Gnostics that our salvation is based on knowledge, right? So in 2, 3, he says, and I think this is, uh, you know, I think this is, uh, what, what did I say that was? In, uh, a play on words. A play on words. You, you, you know that you know him not by what you know about him, but by how you obey the commands of him. I think that's a play on words for the Gnostics who know that they know him because they know him. And John say, no, you don't know that you know him because you know him. You know that you know him because of what you do with what you know. So in the same way in verses 7 and 8, I think there's a little play on words over here. He's saying, look, I'm writing no new commandment. I'm giving you an old commandment. Uh, it's an old commandment that you had from the beginning, but in verse 8, it's really a new commandment. And uh, I, I, I think there's something he's trying to say here that makes you ponder and think, what is he talking about? Is it old or is it new? And notice in verses 7 through 11, we see imagery here of light and dark. You know, John's good at these analogies, light and dark, vision and blindness, love and hate, you know? And so in verse number seven, he, he begins by saying, brethren. And so this, what he's addressing is the church. It's one thing to say, love, love your enemies outside of the church. Yeah, okay, they'll go into all the world. And, yeah, that's right. Sometimes it's easier to love people at a distance than love people that are close up. But brethren, he said, brethren, uh, I, I write to you no new commandment, but I'm writing to Christians in chapter 2, verse 21. He says to them, I know that you know the truth. So these aren't new Christians. These are just Christian people. They need some help in dealing with different things. And he says, I, I'm not giving you a new commandment. I'm giving you an old commandment that you heard from the beginning. Well, what did they hear from the beginning? Remember, it was John who wrote John 3.16. God so loved the world. It's John who wrote John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. So these Christians heard from the beginning of their walk with God the, the commandment to love God and, and to love each other. So it's not a new commandment, it's an old commandment. But in verse number 8, he's saying, but again, I'm telling you, it's a new commandment for you right now. So I think his personality is showing right here. I think he's saying kind of tongue-in-cheek, this is not new, it's old, but it's new for you. You can't read about it. You can't like just discover it by reading it or hearing about it. You have to experience it in your own heart. But he says in verse number 8, and verse number 8 is a very interesting verse of Scripture. It says, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in God. It's true in God, and it's true in you. So this, this is one of those verses, it's like 1-7. If you walk in the light, you really ha you're on your way. But it, right here, the, if you have this new commandment, it's true in God, and the new commandment is true in you. If you got that, 
In other words, if you're born again, if you're submitted to God, if you're walking in the light, you have this new commandment in your heart. It comes with the territory, so to speak. But verse number 8, because now darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Well, the darkness in your life is getting less and less and less. Because you're born again, you're walking in the light, and the true light is already shining. You're not perfect yet, but you're on your way. So he's saying in verse number 8, this new commandment, uh, which, which, uh, which is true in God, it's true in you, you know, you, you got this going in you because the, the sin, the, the ugliness of the world in your flesh is dying out, and your spiritual life is building up. You have this new commandment. Growing up, I, like many of you, I was raised in the church, not born again. But I was well aware of what Christmas was, well aware of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, well aware of the ascension, and even I heard about the second coming. I heard about Pentecost Sunday. I knew it, but when I was born again, those truths, those things, took on a whole nother life in my spirit. They became new to me. I remember the first time I had communion as a born-again believer. And I had communion all my life. But when I was born again, it was like, oh my goodness. This is, like the light went on. This is what it's about. And that's what John is saying here. You have an old commandment to love your brother, but now that you're born again and you're on the right track, and darkness is fading and light is growing, you have this new commandment in your heart. It's not new, but it's new for you. Wow. This is a good word right here. And not only is it good for you, it's, it's good for wherever you are in your walk with God. You could be a Christian for 50 years, and this truth could get old. <laughs> and what he's saying is you can't afford to let this truth get old. This is essential for Christianity. So verse number 8, very, very important verse. So then, then he goes into verses 9 through 11. And verses 9 through 11, to me, are the reality check. Like I said, in the context of when he wrote this, it was pretty obvious what he was dealing with. Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, different language groups, different personalities, whatever, different, you know, different people, different social statuses and so forth. But there are some today that think that they have legitimate reasons to hate somebody in the church. I speak from 30 plus years of pastoral experience. Let me put it this way. Real life situations. What do you do if a fellow Christian sins against you or your family? No remorse, no contrition, no consequences, and you're left more or less holding the bag. Well, Jesus addressed that in Matthew 18. He said, well, if a brother sins against you, go talk to him, try to work it out. If you work it out, you gain the brother. If it doesn't work out, get someone to go with you and try to work it out. If you work it out, you gain the brother. If it doesn't work out, tell the church. Let the church elders get involved and try to work it out. If you work it out, praise God, you, earned, you won a brother. But if it doesn't work out, Jesus said, let him go. Treat him like a heathen or a tax collector. Let him go. Don't even deal with it anymore. Let God deal with it. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, he said to withdraw from every believer who walks disorderly and not according to the truth that you learned from us. So verse number 9, to me, it's like you say one thing and you do another thing. It says, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Well, you can't say you're in the light and hate your brother. You can't allow those seeds of bitterness and anger and frustration to build up and build up and turn into hatred towards somebody. Let me define what hate is because I really want to know what, what this means. Because, I mean, there are times when, you know, for instance, we may not like somebody in the body of Christ. We may be upset with somebody. We, we may not want to spend time with someone for a period of time because we're mad at them or whatever. Does that constitute hate? Well, it depends. But what I found out, hate defined, the word is miseo in Greek, 
But the, the word means a malicious and unjustifiable thinking towards someone else. So you may be standing next to someone worshiping God and, you know, wishing evil on the person next to you. We can't allow that. We can't let that happen. It's desiring bad things to happen on someone else. It's not caring about someone's well-being. It's not wanting to reconcile, not even open to the idea of it. It's not seeing any good in the person whom God created. And we can't say one thing and do the other thing. So verse number 9, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is not in the light. He's in darkness until now. So let's bring it home a little bit. Let's say you, you attend a church and there's a man or a woman in the church that sexually violates your son or daughter in the restroom of the church. What do you do with that? You know, some people may want to give someone a black eye right there. You know, you've seen, it, you've seen footage of uh, court hearings when something like that happens. What about when you're in church and someone verbally assaults you or your loved one? No hint of sorrow, no remorse, just a doubling down, just obstinate. What do you do with that? Or what about a person who embezzles money from your church, steals money, gives your church a bad name, gives you, your pastor and your leadership a bad name because of their own greed or their own whatever? You feel disgust, you feel anger. And in that setting, hatred could develop if you're not careful. And verse 9 says, no, you can't say you're in the light and hate somebody. There's a different way now. There's a better way now. The old is made new. And some of us may never even know that whole thing about loving your brother until you're faced with a situation where you have to. Because you think you're all set. Because you never were tested in it. It's when you're tested, it's when the truth comes out of what's in your heart. Then verse number 10, I love, I love these verses. Verses 8 and verse 10, they're life-giving verses, if you could really catch what he's saying here. Let me read verse 8 again. I just love it so much. Again, a new commandment, not a new and old, but a new commandment to you, I write to you, which this commandment is true in God, it's true in you, because the darkness is passing away, light is building up in you, you're on your way, you're born again, hallelujah. This truth is yours. Verse number 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light. Let me put it this way. He who loves his manipulative brother, he who loves his obnoxious, sinful brother, he who loves the, the person who's offended him, abides in the light. Can I just put a commentary right here? You would never love that person if you weren't in the light. You, you, it wouldn't happen. The only way you could love that person is by being in the light. I mean, it's, it's easy. Would you just read it? He who loves his brother abides in the light. Oh, it's like a nice love, like a fairy tale. But the reality is, what if that person really bothered you, sinned against you, really hurt you? What do you do with that? But if you're walking in the light... Regardless of what they did, their problem's not going to become your problem because you're in the light. And you love them anyway. You love them through it. But he who, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. What a, what a scripture this is. In other words, the reason we stumble, the other person may not even know what we're dealing with on the inside. But we're stumbling because we can't stand this person. We have angst against them. We're not dealing with it. And then we stumble. And we're the victim, but now, we're the, now we become the offender as well to God because we're not dealing with it right. And we stumble in other ways. We lash out in other ways. You think about the various dynamics in the church. Oh, my goodness. There are so many things that go on in relationships. Amen? So many things. Why do you think some people leave? <laughs> That's why, basically. They'll go somewhere else until it happens over there. So, verse number 10, okay, he who loves his brother abides in the light. Yeah, you, you can't love unless you're abiding in the light. I mean, for those Palestinian, those Jews, there's no way they're going to love each other unless they're in the light. Those Taliban and Afghani Christians, if they were to meet, they would have to be in the light. And that person who violated my family, I would have to be in the light to, to honor him and love him back in spite of what he did. But that's exactly what God is calling us to do. 
Can we do it on our own strength? I can't. Tell you right up, I can't do that. But with God's help, we must do that. But there's no room for failure, verse number 10. There's no room for stumbling when we're walking in the light, even though someone may do something idiotic. We're cleansed, we're, we're pure, we're humble, we're broken before Christ, we're unhindered by bitterness and anger, we're unaffected by another person's sin. Their sin doesn't become our problem. <clears throat> Verse 11. But he who hates his brother, but again, it's an oxymoron. You, you can't say you're in the light and you're a Christian and, and hate your brother at the same time. It, it doesn't work. So he who hates his brother, he's in darkness. He walks in darkness. He doesn't know where he's going. He's blind because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He's lost. And so I've entitled this Love Made New. This, this is not anything we don't know. We, we all know this. Let me give you an illustration before I get into my application. I don't know if, if you could relate to this. Some of you might can, maybe, I don't know. I'll just put it out there. I may have shared this at one point. But for me, high school was a very emotional time. I switched high schools in between ninth and 10th grade. And uh, in my family, there's a history of sports and athletics. And you know, my brothers did real good at the other high school. I came to a new high school right, right next to it. And when I graduated, I made a vow. I'm never going back to that high school again. Especially, I'm never going to watch that football team play again. I was bitter. I was angry. I was a little stupid, a little, ar a little arrogant. <clears throat> I was frustrated with how things were for me. I didn't like it. And by golly, I'm going to show them I'm never going back to that place again. And I never went back for about 20 years. I never went back. And then through a series of events, we moved back into the area. And uh, I don't know, I started to get curious about my old high school. I'm older now, and I'm a Christian now. But those feelings got stirred up in me. I'm, I'm not going back. I, I hate that school. I hate that coach. And I, it wasn't a real spiritual thing. I just wanted to see a football game. I wanted to go back and see a game. So I, one Saturday, I went back to watch a high school football game. And it was a whole different scene than what I remember. When I was in high school, High school football was a big deal. A lot of people went to the games. It was a big deal. But this is a few years ago now, but I went back. Hardly anyone was in the stands. But it was the same stadium, the same field, the same scoreboard. And I see the team coming out of the locker room. I had all this emotion in me, like, I hate this. But God was working on me. God was working on me. By the time the game was over, I got into the game. I, I was cheering for the team. A healing took place in my heart. I wasn't angry anymore. I wasn't bitter anymore. I was, somehow I overcame it just by being there. They probably ran the same plays that when I played 20 years before, for goodness sakes. But it, what changed was me. Love became new in my heart for the situation. And that's what I'm talking about. These are things that we, we probably know these things, but we're, we'll never know how to deal with these things until we get tested in them. And for me, going back to my old high school, that was an amazing event. And then uh, two years ago, we had our 50th reunion. That was another amazing event, which I won't go into right now. But for me to go there with my wife, um, and to face up to some people and situations was a miraculous healing event in my life. But I knew that God was doing something new in my heart. What I'm saying is, this is love made new, and it never ends. If you, if you get through this one, there's going to be another one down the line, guaranteed. There's, there's always going to be another situation where you've got to, you've got to work through something. And, and typically, it's having to do with loving people that hurt you. And it could very well be in your own families. It could be in your, your upbringing, whatever. 
at work. It could be a, a number of different scenarios, but God is calling the church to be better. And, and, you know, and in my flesh, I don't want to be better. I want to get even, but in my spirit, I want to be better. And that's what this is about. God is calling us to make this whole love idea new today, new, new every day, actually. This whole love thing has to be new every single day because there's always going to be something to get in our way. So I wanted to give you some things to think about. And the first one is this. When you're talking about love being made new in your heart, we've got to remember the greatest commandments. I mean, this isn't something, someone asked Jesus, Lord, what's the greatest command? He could have picked anything. In Matthew 22, he said, well, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. That's the beginning. How could we love God and hate our brother who God died for? So remember the greatest commandments. And then without asking, Jesus throws in the second greatest commandment. The second one is like the first one. You've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Oh, oh. It's one thing to love God. Now you, have, now you tell me to love my neighbor? In this context, it's loving your brother or sister in Christ. Christianity is founded and rooted in love. It's, it's a love religion, if you want to call it a religion. It's a love relationship. It's Jesus' love for the world and his love for the church and the church's love for Jesus and for the church and for the world. John 4, 1 John 4, 21 again, whoever loves God must love his brother also. This separates us from other religions of the world. We have got to be rooted and grounded in love. 1 John 3, 18 is a very sobering verse of scripture for me. It says, if you don't love your brother, you know what it says? If you don't love your brother, John says, if you don't love your brother, you're a murderer. That's like Jesus saying, if you lust after a woman, you committed adultery already. John said, if you don't love your brother, it's like you killed him already. I don't know about you, I don't want to be guilty of that. These are very human, very real emotions that we feel. But note, when Jesus said the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment, we can't love our neighbor as ourself until we learn how to love ourselves. We can't love ourselves until we give it all to God and let God love us. I mean, it's an unreasonable task to say, love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love yourself. Many of us have a problem with that. How do you love yourself? Well, you, you can get richer, you can get more educated, you can get more money, whatever you want to do, get a bigger house. It's still you. But you begin to love yourself when you begin to love, love God and trust God to reveal himself to you. And you realize you may not think you're anything, but you know what? You're, some, you're somebody enough that God died for. That should put a little self-esteem in your spirit right there. You're, you're worthy of him, of his death. Amen. You're worthy of him coming to rescue you. You're worthy of him reaching down when you were out. He's reaching down to help you. That, that gives you something. He loves you, so you have to love yourself in that regard. And when we love God and love ourselves, then, yeah, we can look at that other person that hurt us or abused us or whatever and realize that person's, he's sick, he, he's, he's sinful, he's, he's like me. <laughs> he needs God. And who am I to let seeds of bitterness and hate well up in my heart? He may not even know about what's going on in my heart. Now, I had this one guy one time many, many years ago when we were in Connecticut. This guy came up to me out of the blue. I was an associate pastor. He said, Pastor Rick, I forgive you for what you did. I had no clue what the brother was talking about. Honest to goodness, I had no clue. I said, I said okay, what are you talking about? And he was really mad. He held on to this thing for a year. I still don't know what it was. Why well, said something or did, he thought I was talking, I don't know what he thought, but he held on to this for, it was killing him. I had no clue. 
Finally, thank God, he came up to me. He came up to me in anger, but at least he came up to me. And we talked it out, and he, he, he resolved it in his spirit. But I wasn't damaged by it. He was, the poor guy. And that's what happens when we let this fester and the, the anger and the bitterness turn. I don't know if he hated me. I don't want to go down that road. I don't think he hated me. But he didn't like me. And it was so unjustified. But when we let it fester, it just makes everything bad. So can we learn, do what Jesus said. Remember the greatest commandments. Love God and, 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 love, your, and love yourself and appreciate yourself. God made you. There's only one of you. I love talking to my grandkids when they tell me how, how unique they are. Their fingerprints are different, you know, like a snowflake. I, it's true. I said, oh my goodness. Everyone's uniquely made by God with a purpose. Then the question is, well, how do you love God? Yeah, love God with all your heart. Yeah, how do you do that? Well, not to sound cold, but I think the answer to that question is you decide to do that. You dis love is not an emotion like that. It's, it's a decision. You decide to trust God. You decide to pray to God. You decide to come to church. You decide to lift your hands and praise God. You, you make a decision to run after God with all your heart. You may not even feel like it, but you know it's the right thing to do, so you do it. You just do it. You, and and look, at, look at chapter 2, verses, verse 15. So love, God says, do not love the world or the things of the world. So some things you love and some things you don't love. But you must begin to love God. And when you love God, you begin to appreciate who you are in Christ. And then you can begin to appreciate that other person that may have hurt you. Someone different than you. Someone maybe uh, what I would call a difficult person. I won't go into details there because I think you know what I'm talking about. A difficult person. Or, or you, you may have to, you know, reach out and love someone, and you'll get nothing in return from it. It's not about you getting anything in return. Maybe a little peace of mind, but you won't get any slap on the back. You're just doing the right thing out of obedience. So I would say, if you want to make love new in your heart, remember the greatest commandments. That's number one. Number two is this. Remember the new commandment. In John 13, and the setting is very crucial, to understand, the Last Supper, whenever anyone speaks their final words, it's like important. They're important words to say. Here Jesus is at the Last Supper. He's got the Passover meal. He's got the new covenant instituted. He predicts Peter's denial and Judas's betrayal. He washes the disciples' feet to show them who the greatest one is in the kingdom of God, is the one who serves. They sing a hymn. They go out to the garden. But in that setting, before they left, Jesus says, look, you 12, I'm giving you a new commandment. This is the commandment. The way that I loved you, and you know that I loved you. You know I'm dying for you. So the way that I love you, I'm commanding you to love each other. Last thing he said, you got to love each other. Forget about the world right now. Just love each other. And all the world will know that you're my disciples, not by how loud you are, not by what you say or do like that or your accomplishment. They'll know that you're my disciples by the love that you have with each other. And that testimony will ring out and touch a lot of people's lives. And I, I find it so interesting that John, who wrote 1 John, was there that night at the Last Supper. We read it in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. John said, these things that we we saw and we handled, we, we declared these things to you, but we heard Jesus say them firsthand. And now he said, I was there that night when he said, love each other. And John, if you know his story, he, was, he has a little bit of a history. He and his brother James, sons of thunder, because they were loud and spoke out of turn and wanted to rain, have fire rain down on, where was it, Samaria? And Jesus said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what spirit you have. And now here's John sitting at the table hearing Jesus say that, and he puts his head on his breast and it's recorded, this is the one whom Jesus loved. But the true mark of Christianity is how we love each other in the body of Christ. So let me get a little more deeper than I am already. I know I'm deep. But what about someone from a different denomination? You know, those other little Baptists or those, those Episcopal, whatever. Yes! you got to love them. 
They're brothers and sisters in Christ. They go to a different church. Well, praise God they're going to church. What about if they have different beliefs? I call them secondary beliefs. What if they're not Pentecostal? Oh, oh, oh. love them. What if they're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, whatever? Love them. What if they're once saved, always saved? Love them. What if they leave our church and go to another church? I saw a post on Facebook some time ago. They had something to the effect, when someone leaves your church and goes to another church, it's not like they're in another gang right now when you're, you're having a fight against another gang. We're on the same team. They're just in another place. You have to love them. Thank God they're going to church. Pray for those that leave and don't go to church. Pray that maybe God will enlighten us. Why do they leave? That's maybe another sermon. Love made new. Love made new. Let me go to the number three. I want to wrap it up with this. Remember, in all of this, this what John is saying, 1 John 2, 7 to 11, there's a better way to handle it. Hate is not the answer. Christians can't afford to hate people. So we've got to love God, love people. Danny Gokey sings a great song. It all comes down to this simple truth. You've got to love God and love people. And if there's a problem, if there's an offense, if there's a hurt, and, and, and obviously he's writing this, so there will be. This isn't like hypothetical. This is like when it happens, this is what you have to do. So it's going to happen sooner or later. What do you do? You can't hate. You can't let bitterness fester in your heart. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. And in, inside, man, you want to kill somebody. I'm talking about it in the church. I'm always, for a long time, when I first came to the Lord, I, I really thought that the church was like for people that were like way up here. And after a little while, I realized, I don't know about that. It seems like everyone's on the way. It's a better way to look at it. We're, we're all on the way. You know, some are a little higher than others, but none of us have arrived. You know, we're all a work in progress, I guess you could say. And so when you read the epistles, when Paul especially says some heavy things to the church, you say, man, it sounds like he's writing to people that aren't even saved. Well, maybe in that place, maybe a lot of them weren't, but they were in the church anyway. But anyway, so love God and love people. And when there's a problem and there's an offense or a hurt, you can't take the approach of the world or your, your worldly way. You know, I, I, I'm not so proud of this. It's a little bit funny, but... When I was a kid, before the Rocky movies ever came out, right? You know what my nickname was? Rocky. I, I was Rocky before Rocky. Why was I Rocky? I was a little kid, and I, I had a short fuse in the playground at school. I got in some fist fights with some people. I was, it wasn't a big, big deal, but there were, there were boxers at the time named Rocky. There were a couple of famous, so I, that was nicknamed Rocky. Plus, my grandfather was Rocky. So I was rocky. Because I know my, my, my temperament at the time w would go from zero to 100 really quick. <laughs> so now I'm saved. And that old man is still percolating down there once in a while, I have to say. It's still, I got to keep an eye on it because I know me. I know the temperature gauge goes zero to 100 really fast. But see, the old man, you can't live like that. I can't live like that. You know, so, so John, what John is saying, you can't hate people. You can't hit people. You can't yell and scream at people. You can't, you can't do that as you walk in the light. As, as, in fact, if you're in the light, you won't even want to do that. The, the thing is, sometimes we're in the light, but we have a little bit in the flesh. Am I making sense? So anyway, Jesus said, look, when your brother offends you, go talk to him. If it doesn't work, get someone to go with you. If that doesn't work, get the church involved. If that doesn't work, let them go. Release them. Let them go. Don't let their problem be your problem. 1 Corinthians 5 and Hebrews 12, two very important scriptures in this topic. In 1 Corinthians 5, 
Paul tells the church in Corinth regarding a, a man in the church that committed adultery. He said, deliver that one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That's serious to me. In other words, don't go beat him up. And don't let hatred rise in your heart. Release him to Satan. Kick him out. Let him, get him, let him, let him go. And in Hebrews 12, the, the other side of that is, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So either you're going to deliver him to Satan or deliver him to God. Either way, you're out of the picture. Let God deal with it. If God wants to deliver him to Satan, well, that's, a, that's up to him. But I, I say give him to God. Let God deal with that. But you, you, you have a different, you have a better way to deal with it than maybe you used to. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. I read it earlier, but let me read it in the full context. Paul's writing to the church there. He says, we command you. Now, he doesn't say command very often, but he says it in this case. We're, I'm commanding you. We, we're commanding you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if someone said that to you, wouldn't you take, pay attention to that? Like, if I were to say to you, I'm commanding you, church, in the name of Jesus, I'm commanding you. That's pretty authoritative. He says, I'm commanding you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw from, any, from every believer. So that makes me think there were more than one. But every believer who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which, we, which he received from us. Uh, we're commanding you, get out of the argument. Leave it in God's hands. Remove yourself from that. Is that hard to do for some of us? It's hard for me to do, because I'm rocky. <laughs> now I'm rocky with a little r, but I'm still rocky. <laughs> Romans 16, same thing. We studied this on Wednesday night. Paul says to the church in Rome, avoid people that cause division and offenses. Avoid them. Don't hate them, but don't be, you know, don't be unwise. Avoid the confrontation. They're, they're not going to hear you. 2 Timothy 3, turn away from those that have a form of godliness and deny, deny the power of the godliness. Turn away from them. So you have these words, withdraw, avoid, turn away, but don't hate. And Paul had certainly had problems with other people. Alexander the coppersmith, he did me much harm. I'm warning you, stay away from that brother. Philetus and Hermeneus, they, they, they distorted the, the doctrine. Stay away from these people. But he didn't hate them. I think Paul always had an open heart for reconciliation if they wanted to. So there's a better way to deal with it. Either you talk it out, you certainly pray about it, but you protect your heart. And you don't go down this road where you got to be right and prove yourself. That's not our job. That's God's job. So in conclusion, love made new. Everyone here, everyone on live stream, I believe you're following Christ. You're a Christian person. Verse number eight. This, this thing is true. It's a true in God. It's true in you. It's true in all of us. This new commandment. Of course, we're born again. We're, we're spiritually alive in Christ. Love your brother. And the darkness in your life, in my life, is getting smaller. The light is getting greater. So in that, we've got to stay Stay focused on the greatest commandments. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. The new commandment. Love one another in the body of Christ. I was telling someone after the first service. The thing about that is the body of Christ for us is hard. This is not the only body of Christ. This is a local body. What about the one down the street or the one over there or the one up in Plasta? There are a lot of bodies of Christ. But there's one overall body of fellowship in our community. And in that community of believers, man, there's a lot of stuff going on, if you know anything about the dynamics. There's a lot going on in that bubble of faith. But in that set, like common ground, 30 people praying together, all from different churches praying together on Thursday night. Wonderful situation. But you have to know, in those different groups, of fellowship groups, there's all sorts of things going on. But in the context of that, We've got to learn to love and appreciate every single one of them. That's when God will really manifest his power, when there's unity in the body. And thirdly, there's a better way. The old way brings death. The new way brings life. 
The new way is to talk it through, pray it through. Leave it alone. Let God have it. And don't be, don't be a, a pawn in the, in the hands of Satan to cause further division and hurt within the body of Christ. So I want to close by reading verse number 10. It says, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. I would say it like this. He who loves his brother must be abiding in the light. Otherwise, he wouldn't be loving his brother. And in that relationship in the light, he is protected from stumbling in his own walk with God. Can we stand together? Let's say that verse out loud if we can. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Let's say it again, all together. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. All right, every head bowed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but there may be some today or live stream that need them to forgive somebody because the hurt is deep. There may be some that don't know what to do. They're frustrated. There may be some that don't know how to love people that have been so mean-spirited toward them. There may be some personal need in a family and a family relationship. I want to cover it all in prayer right now. So let's pray. Father, Lord, when I first started to prepare for this message, I thought, Lord, everybody knows all this. But as I got into it, Lord, you, you began to focus on my own heart. And I realized if I struggle, and I, I, there are times when I struggle with this, I know others are struggling too. But I pray, Lord, that the new creation aspect of our walk with you, the born again relationship that we have with you will be current, will be for today, will be for right now. And for right now, Lord, may this old truth become new in our hearts. We've got to love people. We've got to love people that are different than us, that think different than us, that maybe hurt us intentionally or not intentionally. We've got to rise above it because how we act towards one another uh, reflects on how the world receives our message. And Lord, we don't want to ruin that. So help us, Lord, to love and respect each other. For the certain individual that may have had a real tragedy, maybe there was a sexual abuse or maybe there was some type of thing that happened in the church, uh, in the body of Christ. Uh, maybe there's something that happened among Christian people and it's not right, but it happened. Lord, may there be grace to forgive, grace to move on, grace to learn from experiences and to be better for what we have failed at. I pray, Lord, for everyone, for anyone that's dealing with these types of issues today. Lord, we can't afford to let these seeds of bitterness develop into seeds of hatred. Especially, Lord, when we look at what's going on in the world around us, it's no time for the church to be faltering. It's time for the church to rise up and meet the needs of our community and our nation. So help us, Lord, as a, as a community of believers to truly love and respect one another and to work things out under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Heal the broken, humble the proud, and strengthen all of us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. We thank you, for it, Lord, and we pray it all in the precious, glorious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everybody said, amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Go in peace and go in love, and let love be made new in your heart today. God bless you.